Welcome everyone. My name is Cindy McDonald. I'm very glad to be with you today. We're going to be talking about neurodivergent students and what that means and how you can work with them. I'm very pleased and honored to have with me Dr. Eric Endlich, and he is a psychologist and founder of the Top College Consultants. He's a licensed psychologist. He has a degree from Berkeley a master's from NYU in Boston, and a college counseling certificate from UC Irvine. So welcome, Eric. I'm glad to have you here today. Thanks. Good to be here, Cindy. And they are lucky to have you as an instructor. Oh, well, thank you. So tell me a little bit more about your background. Let everybody know about your background and how long you've been working with neurodivergent students. Sure. Well, um, as, as you said, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So working, I've been working for decades in, in the mental health field and, and uh, so many years of working with teens and particularly uh, neurodivergent teens. And then I kind of discovered the field of educational consulting and fell in love with it. And um, so been working as an IEC for five years or so, um, but, but had um, quite a few years working with, with teens before that. Um, what else did you have in the question? <laughs> so how did you get, how did you come to focus or um, have your training based around neurodivergent students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, over the years as, as a therapist, I was working with folks um, with all kinds of challenges, anxiety, depression, relationship, career issues, sports psychology even. Um, and, uh, but you know, back in 1999, my son was uh, diagnosed as a toddler as being autistic. And so we really got um, immersed in the autism and special needs world for many years. Uh, well, you know, ever since then. And, and then quite a few years later, um, I realized that he's not the only one in the family on the spectrum that, that I'm autistic as well. And so, um, I became even more interested in, in autism at that point. Co wrote a book about autistic adults, um, got very involved in the Asperger Autism Network, AANE, in the Boston area, and um, started writing and speaking on autism related topics and really focusing on that population. And then ultimately, when I you know, transitioned to becoming an educational consultant, really focused on helping neurodivergent students and students with all kinds of challenges um, transition to college and grad school. That sounds like quite a journey. And yeah. it's interesting that it was a personal journey for you as well. Yeah, turns out my, my daughter has ADHD too, but she didn't get diagnosed till much later. As uh, I'm sure you know, uh, women often diagnoses get missed. So yeah, yeah well, so I, I'm, I'm in it as, a, as a parent, as a self-advocate, um, a psychologist and consultant, I wear many hats. Well, but that makes you an effective counselor and advisor for students and families. So which term we've, we've heard, and I've used in my course, different terms. You hear neurodiverse and neurodivergent. So mm -hmm. which term is preferred? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So um, Diversity is a property of groups, um, biodiversity, cultural diversity, uh, neurodiversity. So an individual can't be diverse or, or uh, neurodiverse um, because only a group can be diverse. Um, so uh, if you're talking about an individual, that individual would be divergent or neurodivergent if their brain works differently. Um, that being said, and, and that's straight from the person, uh, Judy Singer, who's an autistic sociologist who coined the term neurodiversity, and she's very clear on, on how she intended it to be used, and, and that is how the term diversity is used, too. Um, that being said, I understand how language works. Most people kind of tend to use the word neurodiverse. Many people use that to refer to individuals, um, so even though that's technically incorrect, because it's so common, I think you know, it's going to become the accepted terminology in our language, even though it doesn't really make grammatical, semantic sense. Yeah, that happens sometimes. <laughs> with, uh, yeah. Language and things. Yeah, uh, language but, is, is how we use it, regardless of how it was designed. Mm -hmm. But it is important to understand the differences, understand the intent, 
and then be able to use it correctly. So, you know, points is not anonymous autistic, though certainly a, a significant proportion of folks who are neurodivergent are on the autism spectrum. It also includes people with ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, uh, learning disabilities, and, you know, uh, many people feel it should include um, various mental health conditions too. So it's a, it's a much broader term than autism. That just happens to be an area that I'm especially knowledgeable about. That's a good point as well. So what is it about neurodivergent students that delights you? Well, I mean, I, I want to help all students who, uh, I mean, my mission is to, to inspire hope in others and, and to help folks uh, transition to higher education who would otherwise struggle or have a challenge, whether that's because of their um, socioeconomic situation um, or being neurodivergent or other challenges. Um, you know, I like helping people who, um, you know, the, the underdog, so to speak. And uh, if you're neurodivergent, for various reasons, you've probably run into challenges your whole life. Um, you know, I, I co-wrote a book on autistic adults, and in our research, 80% uh, of the respondents had been bullied in childhood, just to, you know, which is much, much higher than the, the base rate for the population. So, um, just as sort of one example of, you know, what, what provides additional challenges for, for folks who are neurodivergent. In addition, a pretty large percentage have anxiety and other challenges. There's all that anxiety of, you know, fitting in and being accepted and being pulled out for special education classes and all kinds of challenges that kids go through their whole career up until the point where they leave high school. Um, so, you know, it's, and also I like a challenge. So um, I work with neurotypical students sometimes too. I, I you know, end up with, with a small number here and there. And uh, they're delightful, but they're, they're really easy by comparison. Um, and uh, so I, I like the challenge of working with, with neurodivergent students. And they're really interesting. And also I can relate to them. So, you know, when I Sometimes I'll meet these autistic students and sometimes they're referred to me by other consultants who, who say, you know, well, I met this student, we did, really didn't connect and I meet them and I'm like, well, yeah, I get it, they're autistic, they don't show much facial expression or they don't have a lot of range in their voice. Um, I, can, I can relate to them and often relate to their interests. Um, People on the spectrum tend to have one or more intensely focused interests, which um, are often referred to as special interests or deep interests, if you prefer. Um, and so I find that really interesting to, to hear about the things that, that students are passionate about. And as you know, colleges like students who are passionate about something. So it turns out, you know, if you can present it correctly, it's, it's really an asset as a student sometimes. Uh, so, so that's interesting to me. Um, and it's something that I've been learning a lot about. So I like being able to share all the resources with families, families that have really struggled up until this point. They've often you know, had to pay extra money for, for all kinds of services. They may have battled with the school district. So they've had all these challenges and it's nice to be able to come in and kind of ease the path for them and say, hey, you may not have known it, but there's these support programs out there that can really help your student and so on. That's very true. That's very true. So connected to that, then how do you communicate? They have unique characteristics or things that they can bring to the college campus, right? So mm -hmm. what are some of those unique contributions that they can bring? Well, as I mentioned, there's, you know, the, the, the passions, special interests, um, and uh, especially, you know, as you go to college where you're starting to focus in on a major and even more so in graduate school, which is more specialized, having an intensely focused interest can be an asset and you can really connect with a professor who maybe shares that, that research interest. So if, if those students can connect with, whether it's a club of other students who like the same things that they like or professors who are researching the area that they're really interested in, they can really thrive and bring their own knowledge, their own, um, you know, they, they may have sort of done their own research or, or become experts in a certain field and really bring something of interest to um, their peers, to, to the faculty, um, and really be exciting for, for other students and faculty to work with. Um, so 
uh, there's that. And I, and I just think that diversity strengthens us all. I think that as a society, um, and there was a great article I just read this week on diversity in uh, STEM fields, how you know, when we're trying to solve problems, scientific, technological, sociological problems as a, as a group, we need diversity because we need different points of view um, for new ideas, for thinking outside the box. So people whose brains work differently, um, just as with any kind of diversity, it really strengthens a team, whether you know it's in the classroom or in a club or what have you, to um, come up with new ideas and, and creative approaches to addressing things. I think that's a really good uh, point to make. It's those individuals that can think outside the box that are looking at it from a new and fresh perspective that often brings about those breakthroughs. And I think it's just enriching to be surrounded by people who are different from you. I think that's that's a real benefit mm -hmm. that kids go get when they go to college, you know. Um, up until the point that you go to college, many kids have been surrounded by the same set of peers their whole childhood. They may have gone to school with the same kids in middle school and elementary school. And I don't know about other kids, but um, you know, a, a lot of neighborhoods are not very diverse. Some are, of course, but, but some are not. You know, if you grew up in, in the suburbs, it might be kind of um, homogeneous. And so for, for some people going off to college is the first time they've really been around um, a more diverse set of students, whether that is geographically, racially, um, or, or in other ways. And, and neurodiversity is one kind of diversity that I think is really, again, enriching for students to be like, oh, I never really, you know, thought about that. I never really knew there were people like that. And that can open up all kinds of things. Um, sometimes it leads people to go into research related to that. True. Sure. Yeah. Because it's something that's interesting to them. And that's what colleges are trying to do is create diverse student populations as they bring in each class so that they do offer that opportunity for their class, you know, yeah. people in the class, students in the class to experience that. And I've been on a lot of college tours as I'm sure you have as well. And when the topic of diversity comes up in these info sessions led by admissions counselors, what they typically say, you know, even if someone asks, oh, can you tell me about diversity at this college? They'll say, oh, we have students from 47 U.S. states and 13 other countries, um, referring to geographic diversity. And then they'll say, oh, we have, um, you know, 20% students who identify as being students of color. And then they typically stop at that point, as if geographical diversity, which most of us don't really care about, and racial diversity are the only two kinds of diversity. What about gender diversity? What about diversity of abilities? How many dis disabled students do you have? How many students do you have, you know, who are um, reporting disabilities to the disabilities office and neurodiversity? So all these other kinds of diversity that I think are really important to, to be looking at that I think have been underappreciated up until now, but I do believe that's gonna change. And slowly but surely, right? Yeah. So, so going back to that, and let's talk about the college process then. Uh, what makes that college process potentially more challenging for neurodivergent students? Yeah. Well, excellent question. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, frequently a lot more challenging. I mentioned before uh, mental health challenges. So, uh, a large percentage are often challenged by anxiety, uh, might be social anxiety or other kinds of anxiety, OCD. There's lots of diagnoses that, that often overlap. Um, many students on the spectrum uh, are also um, um, atypical in terms of their gender or sexuality. So they may have intersectionality with um, you know, gender and neurology. So there's all these you know, things that they're concerned about and how am I gonna fit in? How do I find a college campus that's a good fit for me? In addition, and unfortunately, it's a, it's a long list of challenges. Um, most of these students, especially those on the spectrum and with ADHD, have challenges with executive function. Um, so organizing, planning, procrastinating, um, keeping track of things. And um, that's, of course, not only a challenge in getting your homework done in high school, but the whole college process. You've got you know, to choose between thousands of colleges, if you, if you struggle with kind of organizing and planning, that's a, a big challenge. For many of these students, um, obviously, if they have dysgraphia, dyslexia, 
um, writing can be a huge um, area for, for them that they struggle with. Um, it, because it, the writing the essay on the college application, it's, it's one of the least structured tasks. Um, you know, when you're in a math class and you get a set of math problems or you're doing a, um, a science lab, those tend to be very structured assignments that some of these students really thrive with. Um, and, you know, some of my students are great in English and, and writing, but others really struggle with that. And the Common App essay is a particularly unstructured task. It's essentially like, just tell us something about you and, you know, right. write for up to 650 words could be just about anything very unstructured um, so that so that's hard too and then you know the whole process as I said of kind of figuring making the college list and planning out tours and um, there's a social piece to the application process of connecting with admissions reps and you know going to college fairs and big noisy environments at the college fairs so there's some of that social interaction and networking that that can be um, difficult for some of these students too so there's a whole bunch of areas and and I help kind of simplify it and pave the way and try to make it more fun and, and manage, help them manage their stress and anxiety along the way. And I think that's the key. Not only is it helping manage their anxiety, what about the parents? Parents too, sure. And, you know, of course, a lot of what I'm saying applies to families of neurotypical kids too. It's, it's anxiety provoking for many families to go through this process, um, as most IECs can attest to. Um, I just think it's even more so if you're a special needs parent and, um, and I'm a special needs parent myself. So you tend to be kind of overprotective of your child. They're often vulnerable. Um, they, many of them are sort of more naive. They, they, they lack certain kinds of social awareness. So they're vulnerable to being exploited in college. So you're, you're worried about them being far from home. You're worried about, you know, what kinds of things can happen to them on a college campus. Um, so there's that added level of anxiety for parents about, well, really don't want them to be an hour, more than an hour away from home, or, you know, they've never lived away from home before. I don't know how they're going to be. Maybe they should stay at home and go to community college. Um, you know, I've always helped them with their homework or helped them, you know, get out the door in the morning. Are they going to be able to do that when they're living away from home? That Again, the executive function piece. So it's all these worries that parents, special needs parents have. Um, above and beyond what parents and neurotypical kids have um, that we are dealing with. And so a lot of that comes down to dealing with um, college readiness and helping, you know, thinking about a gap year, thinking about doing programs during the summer so that kids kind of get up to speed. And by the time they go to college, they're not jumping into the deep end. They have been away from home before. They have shown that they can um, organize and master certain tasks and challenges. That makes a lot of sense. So what should they be looking at when you're looking at the college list? Are there things they should automatically count off or count on? So what should be part of that process? Yeah. Of well, you know, uh, of course, all, all the same things as for any other family, like the distance and the size of the college and the cost of the college and uh, does it have the major you're looking for? So all the usual suspects, the usual things. Um, and then in addition, you know, the, the, the key piece here uh, or pieces are um, what are your support needs in college? You know, what supports, services, and accommodations are you going to need when you go to college? And, you know, how college ready are you? Are you ready to go to any college in the country? Would you be able to thrive at any college? Or do you need a college that's going to have more of a safety net or a program in addition to a college. So um, as you may know, there are some residential programs where students will live at the program, sort of like a dorm, but not part of the campus, and then attend a nearby college. <clears throat> um, so that's a much more kind of holding, nurturing, um, wraparound situation where a student comes home from classes and they're surrounded by staff who can help them decompress and process the challenges of the day and deal with their feelings and help them get their homework done and think about the social cha challenges. Um, so, um, so some of it is sort of figuring out what level of support do you need and then where can you get that of all the colleges out there, which ones are going to be best suited to you in addition to taking into account all those other factors like distance, cost, location, size, and so on. 
And uh, I don't assume right off the bat, just because somebody has a diagnosis that they have specific support needs. Um, you know, I just met a student this week who um, had really good executive function and um, his mom said that um, she didn't have to help him at all with, with uh, assignments or homework. So he's way ahead of the game. He's um, not only ahead of many of his neurodivergent peers, but probably a lot of his neurotypical peers in that department and really pretty college ready, at least in that, in that area of being uh, time management and ass managing assignments. So that can vary from student to student. But if another family comes along and, and parent says, oh, they, they can't even remember to put their homework in their backpack, or they, they won't get off their phone and do their assignments unless I, I'm really on them, um, that student's gonna need, you know, probably academic coaching or executive function coaching in college, um, which they might get through a program located, you know, built into the college at an extra cost probably, or from an add-on standalone independent program. So what are some of the questions that you ask students in order to determine what level of support they're going to need? What kind mm -hmm. of social or emotional um, skills, life skills do you, you know, uh, assess? Sure. And, and some of that depends on, you know, what their, what their issues or diagnoses are. So for example, mm -hmm. if it was, a, if they had mental health challenges, then I would be looking at their emotional read, readiness. Like let's say they had a history of depression maybe in addition to other diagnoses of ADHD or dyslexia. Um, I would wanna know, you know, do they know what the signs are, the, the warning signs that they're becoming depressed? Do they know, um, do they have sort of go-to strategies for dealing with it when it happens? Um, such as, you know, exercising or reaching out to friends or going for a walk or um, talking to their family. Um, reading a book, whatever, whatever has worked for them in the past it could be journaling. There's lots of different things, meditation. Um, thirdly, you know, do they know the resources out there? If things get worse, do they know how to make an appointment with a counselor? Do they know how to, um, you know, go back on medication if they need to do that? Um, and um, are they going to kind of take these steps if, if they get into that situation? So if they know all the things they need to do and they have the self-advocacy and self-awareness, um, then they're potentially in good shape. And that kind of model applies to other things too. So, you know, do you know if you're getting off track with your schoolwork? Are you able to be on top, top of that? Uh, if, are you the sort of student, if you were, you know, grades were falling, that you would be like, uh oh, um, you know, I'm not doing as well in this class or I'm not understanding the material. I got to go to the professor and talk to the professor. I got to go and check out that peer tutoring that I heard about during orientation. If you know these resources and you have that self-awareness that you're kind of getting off track and you can seek out and advocate for yourself, you're in, you're in good shape. It's not about being flawless or perfect or not having any difficulties. That's not going to happen for any student. It's about being aware of when you're running into challenges and being able to um, access the resources that you need to. So back to your question about, you know, what to ask students, I kind of go through the whole the whole day and uh, the, the whole, um, all the things they need to do. How do you get up in the morning? Do you get up on your own or does, you know, do you have a parent who's getting you up? Um, do you, and same thing as far as getting to school on time, are you able to kind of get yourself organized and get, get to school on time? Or do you have a parent sort of staying on you and making sure that you're, you're getting ready on time? Um, how do you keep track of your assignments? Do you do that totally independently? Do you have, are there staff at school who are checking in with you every day or every week um, and kind of go through all the parts of their schedule and their day to, to look at that and where are the gaps and where are the things they need to work on? And parents and students, um, you know, parents can have important in, uh, in, input on that as well. So I'm not just talking to students, I'm also talking to parents. And in many cases with, the, with their consent, I'm also talking to staff at school, special needs staff, resource center staff, um, teachers, counselors, to get this sort of overall picture of where the student's at, where are the pieces that they need to work on in, in high school, um, how can they start to do that? And um, you know, what are they gonna need in terms of support in college? So does that include them knowing about their own disability? Like, do you ask them to explain what it is that 
that's unique about you? Um, are they supposed to know what their like their their IEP plan is and their diagnosis? What about that aspect? Well, I think self awareness is is sort of the first step in um, in being college ready and and kind of being able to adult. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's self-awareness, self-advocacy, self-management. I talk about all these pieces in, in college readiness. Um, yeah, ideally, I would like kids to know all of that stuff. Uh, do they always? Definitely not. You know, there are parents who are like, oh, I don't want my kid to, you know, they haven't seen their, their neuropsych report. I, I'm afraid it would upset them. You know, that concerns me. I mean, this is about the kid. They, they can't work on things that they don't know they're struggling with. So I think it's important for those to, them to have the insight. I'm not saying I'm going to be the spoiler. I'm going to come along and say, oh, did you know that you had this diagnosis? Of course not. Um, but, but I'm, you know, working with them where they are and saying, okay, so what's your understanding? How does that play out? Um, what, particularly what I ask uh, kids about a lot is um, what are the supports and accommodations you're getting now that you really find helpful? Not just what are you getting, because I can see that on the IEP or the 504, but which ones are you actually using? Because um, kids will sometimes say, oh yeah, I get extra time on tests, but I don't actually need it. I, I, I don't run out of time. Or I have this resource room, but you know, I don't even talk to the resource teacher. Um, uh, but, but they will say, you know, but this other accommodation is really helpful. So sometimes kids will say, um, actually, the extra time on tests is helpful. And I would love to have that in college, too. So we're looking at, you know, what, what is really benefiting you now? And what are you likely to benefit from in college? Um, and some kids are working with executive function coaches in high school and would love to continue that. And it's totally an option to continue it in, high, in college. Ultimately, we want kids to learn tools so they don't need the coaches, but that can take years. And if they do need it for a long time, that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important that students know for all those reasons that you cited for self-advocacy, because how can you communicate, especially at a college level or even at a high school level, you know, what your needs are and, and be your own advocate if you don't understand what they are. And it just, it just puts you at a disadvantage. It puts you in the dark. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and you want to be in a position of strength and, and growth in order to do that. So, yeah. And, you know, I want them to find a college environment that supports that, that mm -hmm. where they don't feel like, oh, I have to hide the fact that I, that I struggle with depression, or I have to hide the fact that I'm on the spectrum, or that I have ADHD. I want them to be somewhere where they can be out, where they can be themselves and be accepted. And, you know, I understand that there's stigma and, and people have had experience of being teased, bullied, or judged. Um, but how are we going to kind of move society forward somewhere? You know, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem at some point. People need to be, this is who I am. And if you accept me, great. And if not, well, maybe I need to look somewhere else for friends. Unfortunately, in college, you know, it's not like high school where there's just a couple of clicks. And if you're, you're not in those group, in the in group, you're, you're out of luck. You know, in college, there's so many different groups. So you can find the group that you connect with and, mm -hmm. and find people who do accept you. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, there are neurodiversity groups. There are, uh, there are mental health self-help uh, support groups of um, college students. So um, these things are out there. They're on the table. People can talk about them and, and educate their peers and have events and, and um, you know, days and fairs at college where other students and faculty can learn about them too. And it's not just educating students. It's faculty too. Faculty are not necessarily experts on these things. Very true. And I think that's key as well, um, because then they might be doing things inadvertently, not realizing that it's disadvantaging or handicapping students just out of yeah. awareness. Sometimes so. it's, a, it's a microaggression um, and, mm -hmm. you know, folks need to be kind of educated on, on what someone might find offensive. Um, sometimes it's more blatant, like a student has has documentation that they're allowed to have a dis um, an accommodation, a disability accommodation, and, and a professor will literally say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't do that for my students. 
um, which is essentially a violation of federal law. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. And, and that's where the self-advocacy piece comes in, where the students need to be able to say, hold on, you're, you know, that's not okay. Um, right. And they, they don't have to like go head to head with the professor. They can go back to the disability services and said, help, what do I do? My professor is saying they won't do this thing. Um, Again, I don't want to make it sound like that stuff happens every day, but it's something students need to be prepared to, to deal with. And if they haven't learned to self-advocate in high school, um, they got to start working on that skill. Um, maybe take a gap year and work on that skill because, again, parents aren't going to college with them. So whether it's with a professor or some other place in college where they hit a roadblock, they, they've got to be prepared to kind of push back or step up and say, hey, this isn't working for me. We've got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what is the one thing that you wish all counselors understood about neurodivergent students? Um, it's hard to pick one thing, but uh, I guess <laughs> one thing would be that um, by and large, they want to have friends and they want to connect they may keep to themselves sometimes for a variety of reasons, could be overwhelmed by sensory stimuli in a, in a large, loud setting, um, could be that they're socially anxious and they're afraid of being rejected, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to have friends. For the most part, they want to connect to other people, and um, they just need to find the right person in the right setting and, and conducive environment for that to happen. And also, as I said before, you know, that they bring, they will enrich the group if you get to know them and, and see what they have to offer. Um, they're going to make life more interesting. So, um, you know, bring them into the mix. Um, it's going to be a better group for it. Definitely. I definitely agree. Well, Eric, thank you very much. This is very illuminating and it's very helpful to be able to talk to an expert like yourself and see what directions and see all the opportunities. Sometimes I especially think for parents, they think, oh, my child has, you know, ADHD or has these different um, issues. And that means they can't go to college. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can share and show them and help them to be college ready, uh, you know, as you said, and that they do have lots of opportunities and options is, it um, can be very in uplifting and, you know, provide families with a lot more hope and opportunity. So yeah, being ready to, to go to college or able to go to college is not a binary thing. Either you, you can or you can't. If your child's not 100% there yet right now, doesn't mean that next year or the year after that they won't be ready. And there's no expiration date on going to college. It's, you know, sure, lots of kids go right from high school, but plenty of people go later in life so that it's never too late. No, no, it isn't. So, well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Good luck to the students. Oh, thank you.